Hi, my name is Daniel Abrahamberg and welcome to my course, Modern Architecture. It is common for senior developers. We are working a couple of years with few products and suddenly we look around and see people are starting to talk about things that we have no idea what they are, like Docker, microservices and Envoy proxy. This course is mainly for senior developers who want to update their knowledge in a very effective way. But if you are a junior developer and you want to learn these things, I think you can also benefit them, but the pace of the course might be slightly fast for you. Think about it, how much you learned in school and how much of it is actually applicable in your daily job. I'd say most of the things you learned are the things that you never ever use again and after a while you're going to forget. So I designed the course to be efficient, the way I wish there was a course when I started to learn all of these things. I just talk about the things you need to know to use in your projects. I remember, for example, when I started to learn about Docker, the course went on and on about all the details and small settings you can do while I was waiting to learn how I can put my own program into the Docker. The question that was never answered after six hours worse of my life. See, as a developer, I learned much easier if I can put my own application into Docker and play with it. Into Docker. It reminds me. One more thing I want to tell you before we start. I don't know why some courses try to speak absolutely correct to the extent that simple things become so overcomplicated and hard to understand. My goal is that you learn the concept, so I might simplify things. I hope you are okay with that. Okay, make sure your cup of coffee is filled and sit back and relax. This is an introduction to the course, so we are making sure that we are all in the same page. I am going to tell you briefly what microservices are, but look, I am not an advocate of microservices and at some point of the course I am going to tell you not to make most of your projects in microservices but there are lots of tools and techniques are used in microservices that you can actually use in your own projects without going for a fully flagged microservice architecture. Then we quickly review some tools and techniques that are used in a fully flagged microservice architecture. And finally, we overview the course's upcoming chapters. Okay, let's begin. This is a very normal multi-tire application that we have been developed more or less forever. You probably recognize it very easily. The client interacts with presentation tire and tires are dependent on each other vertically. Well, if we imagine that presentation layer is on the top and the data layer is in the bottom. And normally a relational type of database is also involved. Could be SQL Server, MySQL, Oracle, or anything else. Let's imagine that this application does three things. You can picture any concept you are familiar with, but I give you an example. Making invoices, keeping customers' contact information, and customer accounts. These are tasks that can be reasonably gathered in a single application. These types of applications are called monolithic applications. Everything is combined into a single program. To ease our way to microservices, let's imagine that we separate those three tasks of the application into three separate programs. Something like this. From the example I gave you, one application is responsible for just making invoices. The other one keeps customers' information. And the third one is responsible for customer accounts. 
Now the question is how our client is going to communicate with these applications. Should it call each of them separately? From our user's perspective or the client, we still want to see one single solution. That's why we introduced something called Gateway. It is an application that sits between users and or applications. Users talk to Gateway and still see one single solution, while Gateway is talking to our smaller applications. Now we have something almost like a microservice that consists of multiple applications that each has different tasks and altogether they serve a single purpose. Each of these smaller applications is a service in our microservice architecture. As a matter of fact, I'm going to call them services from now on. By the way, we are going to have two chapters about gateways. So don't worry if you don't know how to make a gateway yet. The thing about microservices is that services do not need to follow a similar structure or design pattern. For now, let's keep the first one in a multi-tier architecture. Let's imagine that the second one does not have that much of logic. It just reads and writes data to the database. Name, address, telephone number, these kind of things. A simple crowd application suffices for this service. Crowd, by the way, is an acronym for create, read, update, and delete. The third application, though, has a complicated business logic. It gets the user's input, processes it, validates it through a complicated logic and calculates some stuff. I want to apply domain-driven design pattern to this service. We are going to have a chapter dedicated to DDD and also a few chapters that show how to apply tools and techniques when you are doing DDD. Databases are also not need to be of the same types. Let's say SQL Server for this one. For this one though, I want a document-based database because it fits much better for what this service supposedly does. Here we do not need to follow a schema and reading from this type of database is extremely fast. Look, today we are just working with imaginary services here. I am making sure that you understand these services can and most likely should use different databases. I put the MongoDB here and we are going to have a chapter about NoSQL databases and MongoDB. What should we put here? How about a PostgreSQL? That's a good database engine. In a microservice environment, you can even combine platforms and technologies. Like this one is a .NET Core or .NET 5 and above. This one can be a Node.js. And let's say this one is a Java application. Just some examples that we understand we can have different programming languages and technologies in the same solution. Why do we want that? Maybe we find an open source program that takes care of that piece of our solution without we need to make it in-house? Maybe it's easier to do it in a certain platform? Or perhaps it is a case that different teams with different expertise work on different services. It is probably a good time to mention that microservice architecture is mainly mean for gigantic applications with many teams involved. That helps these teams to work separately and do not step on each other's toes. Well, if you think about it, the concept of making several applications that serve the same goal is not new at all. I've seen some during my professional life that was really old. A common example is like this. 
they share a database and they communicate to each other by writing and reading from same shared tables. For example, app 3 receives some data from user and writes some information into the database. The app 1 is a service that regularly checks the database and as soon as it finds a new record on that specific table, it starts to process it, then marks the row in the table as processed with writing some more data in that table and probably even other tables. Then app 2 also reads the database and lets the user interact with that. This though is not a good practice as these applications are dependent on each other. You cannot make changes in one database tables without affecting the other applications. When the scale is small, probably programmers develop some sort of a skill and know if they change a certain table, how it might affect the other applications. While as we scale up with multiple shared tables and multiple applications and many programmers involved, this becomes very complicated. You cannot safely change a thing anymore in your product without having an unknown effect. That is why our industry always tries to find a way to decouple things. So we do not have to face situations that we don't know what happens if you make a certain change in your program. Okay, so if we do not share a database, how our services are going to communicate? They cannot be totally isolated. What we normally do is to introduce an event bus to the system. By the way, some people suggest that services call each other through HTTP or even gRPC. It has some benefits, but it has also lots of negative effects. We discuss it in a chapter. We discuss event buses and message buses. An event bus functions more or less like an email provider, meaning one service sends a message through the event bus and other applications that subscribe to that kind of message eventually receive that message. I use the word eventually because even if that service is not currently available, let's say it's down, it receives the message when it is ready for that. Let's say it's back online. This does not happen through a direct HTTP call because the call is going to fail if your service is not available at the moment. You may ask what happens to the data I need from other services database then? What if my invoicing service needs the address of the customer? Should I query through the message bus and receive the information I need? Good question. It means that you are paying attention. Well, no, it doesn't work quite like this. When your customer's contact information service gets updated, it publishes a message to the event bus. Your invoicing service is subscribed to that kind of event. It receives a message and it updates its own database only with the data it needs from that event. Then it refers to its own database when it needs customers' addresses. Okay, this was a simple introduction to microservices. Now you have as much as information as you need about microservice architecture to continue the course and learn about the tools and techniques. But what are those? Let's review them quickly. You are going to run your apps inside the Docker. We are going to use Kubernetes to make sure our apps are always running in a healthy state. Actually, we are going to run multiple replicas of our services and let Kubernetes take care of managing those replicas. For Gateway, we are going to use Envoy and also Nginx Ingress. We are going to use Azure DevOps to structure work 
Of course, we are using Git as a source version control and also we are deploying our solutions to Linux. So we need to learn some Linux and bash basics. We are going to use DevOps pipelines to test and deploy our apps automatically. Then there are some tools that we are going to take a look at. These are mostly .NET based and these are not specific to microservice architecture. I use most of these technologies in my monolithic apps. I am going to introduce some tools like Visual Studio Code and Docker for Desktop. Okay, now that we know what tools and technologies we need to review, let's sort them as chapters for this course. This was the introduction and we already almost done with the first chapter. I'm going to introduce some tools, Git Bash, Visual Studio Code and Docker for Desktop. Next, we are going through the basic of Linux. How to make a Linux server in AWS and Azure, how to connect to them remotely, how to work with files and some utilities, and we install SQL Server on Linux and run .NET based API on an Ubuntu server. Git as a source version control. If you have not started with Git yet, it's a good opportunity. Docker and Docker Compose. How to put your own app into a Docker container. We take a close look at eShop on container using Docker Compose and inspect different parts of it. Chapter seven will be Kubernetes. Remember when I said we are going to take a look at gateways? No, it is time. DevOps and how to work in Azure DevOps and make pipelines, .NET Core and .NET 5 and above, domain driven design and how to use EF Core for that, dependency injection by Altifac, command query responsibility segregation, message buses, event buses, integration events and rapid MQ, logging, resilience using poly and seeding your database safely by EF Core. No SQL database, MongoDB. And last but not least, unit testing. Congratulations, you made it. You took your first step towards being an awesome programmer by learning the modern architecture. For me, it's enough that you watch the video and enjoy it. But to spread the word and let more people access these videos, if you feel generous, please subscribe the channel and like the video so it goes up into the listing and more people can find it. Thank you very much and see you at the next chapter.